a wonderful week. I had a very, very good week this week. I want Banana. to thank you for that. I hope you two had a wonderful week and that you can testify of the goodness of God in your life. Now, I want every, to see everybody's on. Even if you're in the same house, I want to see everybody's phone on. Uh, the cloud, usually follow the cloud. So you've got to be on. Let's see that you're on and let's get people on in the name of Yeshua. Amen. So I want to say a pleasant Sabbath evening to each and every one of you, wherever you may be. Uh, those of you who are uh, on Facebook, I want to say a pleasant evening to you as well. And I know that we're going to have a very glorious time studying the Word of God tonight. We had a wonderful time on Wednesday, and I want to thank God again for the attendance and the support that I'm seeing coming forward from the brethren on a Wednesday night. Amen. And I give God thanks and praise for that. Tonight, I would be recapping a little from on Wednesday and taking you a step further in this uh, program. Amen. So first of all, let us pray. Welcome the presence of God. And then we're going to start to meticulously uh, go through the thought that we have started with on Wednesday on faith, why we need it so badly uh, under the attacks of humanism. Amen. And the kind of faith that we ne would need to take us through uh, the attacks of this diabolical philosophy. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we praise and we exalt, we magnify and we uplift your holy name, for you are worthy to be praised. We acknowledge you tonight as the only true and living God. There is no other but you. And so tonight, as we approach your throne, we do so in a very humble way, with a very humble spirit, knowing that we of ourselves, we know nothing. But we ask you to bless us, to empower us, and to make us what you want us to be. As we go into your word, this is a sacred place that we are about to enter. We are asking you to reveal unto us your divine thoughts. We are so finite that with our human acumen, we cannot even scratch the surface of your infinite thoughts. But you have promised to us that the anointing is going to teach us. And the only one mm -hmm. that can take us into such depth of your glorious thoughts is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So we ask that you will grant us his presence tonight to open our understanding, to bring conviction where the word of God is concerned and to draw us into a more deeper relationship. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. Through Yahshua the Messiah we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So welcome on each and every one. I I'm hoping that the others will join me soon. Some of those that I'm not seeing yet, Sister Sharmin, uh, Sister Donna, and others. I saw Sister Brooks on a while ago. Sister Brooks, we say a pleasant night to you. Uh, Sister Patsy, I'm very happy to see you on tonight, as you usually are there, and I thank God for you joining us. And to all others, we say thank God for you. So we are talking about faith tonight. Now, I've been saying that, I've been explaining what faith is, and I've been telling you that it is imperative that the children of God in this last days experience to its fullness the full cultivation and development of the initial faith that God has given to each and every one of us. Hear me out well. Because it is, it would be 
that only those who have cultivated and developed faith to its the, this initial faith that God has given to every man, it has stages. It is the faith that God has given to every man initially. That faith is cultivated and, and developed into saving faith, saving faith. And then you have that saving faith being cultivated and developed uh, in such a way where it can now be connected to the ultimate experience of faith, which is the faith of Jesus Christ. I explained to you on Wednesday that faith indeed is the only gift that Yehovah has given to us that would uh, enable us to operate beyond the limits of the five senses. And there's a reason why I am emphasizing this point. It is because based on what is coming, the, 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 the depth of deception of the philosophy of humanism that is coming because of the level of deceptive miracles that would be wrought by the dragon, the false prophet, and the beast. Because of the tribulation that would come upon God's people in a very short while from now, they would need a faith that is able to function outside and above what they can see, what they can hear, what they can touch, taste, or smell. We've got to develop a faith that is beyond all of that. And it is this level and quality of faith that I'm seeking to explain to you. Now, I did say to you on uh, Wednesday that this faith that we are talking about and that we need is the faith of Jesus. It is the faith of Jesus. And I explained to you from the book of uh, Ephesians, I think it was. I will revisit that in a short while. We, we will see in the book of Ephesians, yes, we talked about the faith of Jesus. It's there on different places within the Bible. And I explained to you what it means when it talks about faith of a preposition that indicates uh, a, a to or from. And so the faith that we are looking to understand and to begin to embrace is not our faith merely. That What does that mean? It means that the faith that we would need in the last days is not, will not be the faith that was developed or cultivated through our experience, but the faith that was developed and cultivated through the experience of Christ. We all know that Christ had a very unique experience, a, an experience that no man on earth is able to go through. Thus, the level of faith that he, Yeshua, cultivated belongs strictly and only to him. It is for us to have such connection with him that we are able to share in the faith that belongs to Jesus himself. That's another level that we need to be concentrating on in preparation for what is 
coming, beloved. Yes. Now, I also explained to you on Wednesday that we have to understand where Satan would be coming from. And I said that for Seventh-day Adventists, especially, that Satan would not come directly at our doctrinal position because we are a people of the Bible. And we know that if it goes contrary to the law and the testimony, we have already have a position based on Bible that there is no light. So he's not going to attack our doctrinal position directly. He would first attack our faith. Now this attack on our faith would be attacking our conscious awareness, our conscious awareness of the existence of God and of God's character to fulfill his word. For the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And therefore, he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that is that Yehovah exists, and that he is a rewarder. It will become so difficult that it would appear almost impossible for us to believe that God is truly a rewarder. And so Satan has already started that attack. The question that we want to further address tonight is how do we go about uh, getting that faith that belong to Jesus. Now, this is what I want to concentrate on. Now, God has already told us how to cultivate and to maintain our field. I have shared this thought with you on many occasions. We are 80 June says, faith is depending upon the word and expecting the word to do what it says it would do. This is very easy, if I should say, somewhat easy, when the word itself is very clear. Stay with me now. When the word of God, the Holy Scriptures, is very clear as to what is right and what is wrong. And then there are some cases where we have to listen for the direct voice of God speaking to our consciences to know if what direction to go and if something is right or wrong. Beloved, yes. And, that is, and it is in that place that Satan will seek to work his deception. It would be only those who have connected themselves to the Father through his Son that would be able to distinguish very clearly between that of the voice of God and the voice of the enemy or their own voice telling them what is right and what is wrong. Now let's talk a little bit more as we're going now, more directly into the field. Now in the hours, they'll be coming into those hours if we are not there already, just before the second advent of our Lord, I want to declare to you that the faith of Jehovah's children would be relentlessly tried. And those who are dependent on intellectualism or mere mental assent to the truth that Saturday is the Sabbath, sab the seven days is the Sabbath, and Sunday is not to be kept, they think that in that crisis time, 
that acknowledge that Saturday is the Sabbath and Sunday is not the Sabbath is going to save them. They are not being prepared for the level of mental blockage that Satan would put upon their mind as he did to Christ when he was on the cross so that it, it, it becomes a, a not merely an intellectual thing with this, where this is concerned. Now, because of the momentous role that the faith of Jesus will play in the deliverance of the saints, hear with me here now, in the last days, it is crucial that the believer have a clear knowledge and a clear experience of what that faith is. So we I Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16 speaks to us about the faith of Jesus. I just want to read that for you so you will understand that I'm not mincing words here. There is faith in Jesus and there is the faith of Jesus. Galatians says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus. Amen? So as you look at it, it's, you should observe with me uh, the preposition of that comes between the two nouns, faith and Jesus. It is denoting belonging to or coming from, thus indicating that the faith of Jesus comes from Jesus. I know you haven't heard people talk to you on this level of faith, but I want to really drive this home to you. It is coming from him, thus indicating that the faith of Jesus comes from Jesus, not from us. It is a faith that exists as a result of his experience, Yeshua's personal experience and what he went through in his experience during his 4,000 years in, 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 in the likeness of sinful flesh on this earth. And then the few years when he actually took on our sinful flesh. That experience is so unique that Jehovah understands that, he, that no other man could go through what his son went through and therefore no other man could of their own develop the level and quality of it that Yeshua himself developed during his time. Listen very, very carefully. As John in the book of Revelation sees the final event in the great controversy unfold, he sees the beast power and the world worshipping the beast and his image. He saw multitudes receiving the mark of the beast. He further sees the wicked drinking of the wrath of God, while the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. He saw them in a state of restlessness. And then he saw the saints with that which the Distinguishes them from the wicked, he said. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Hear what they have. The, 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 not, the, not faith in Jesus, you know. They have the faith of Jesus. It means that these people, because of their constant cultivation of faith, that connected them to God so closely, Yeshua was able to share his quality of faith, that level of faith that he experienced based on what he personally went through. We're going to talk about that in a while. I'm getting excited here tonight. Now, again, the faith of Jesus is not the faith that God has dealt to every man. That faith, we used to believe in him. As our savior, we speak of it as having faith in Jesus. The faith of Jesus must come. And I want to, uh, at, the, at, the, at the cost of being repetitive, I want to say it again. 
The faith of Jesus must come from Jesus. This is Christ's personal experience of faith. Yeshua's personal experience with the Father developed a faith within Yeshua that no human being ever had. This faith is unique because of what Yeshua went through. And we will touch that in a, in a while. This faith must, we must all have, but for the most part, people refuse to, to, to develop themselves in order to be connected to that level of faith. Now, remember that Yeshua will only share those that faith with those who through the faith given to all men cultivated that faith, allow it to develop into saving faith, bringing them into a personal relationship with the Father, and now the Son, in order to take them through the final battle of revelation, where worship would be at the center of everything, will bestow upon them his own faith, that unmovable faith, that nothing, even when the, when Yeshua saw himself separated from his father, that faith couldn't be broken. So stay with me. I'm getting excited here. Now, the faith of Jesus is that faith that kept Christ holding on to the Father, even when all his senses said that he was forsaken of him. Are you hearing me now? The faith of Jesus allowed Yeshua to hold on to the Father when all his senses told him he was forsaken of God. The faith of Jesus will enable us to perceive with our spiritual intelligence and allow us to place our spiritual attitude above human rationale. That is serious. Through faith, we must now begin to lessen. Hear me now. Through faith, we must now begin to lessen our dependence on things that are seen and bring into existence those things that are not seen. Remember I told you on Wednesday, beloved, this is so important, beloved, that faith is the only gift of God. Hear me well, quote me with this. Faith is the only gift of God that enables us to function beyond the five senses. I further explain to you that faith doesn't destroy the function of the five senses, but it in it empowers them, it inspires the five senses to see on the level of the spirit. Wait, 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 wait. So let me let me let me help you here now. So we have eyes to see, and we all see. But which one of us has ever seen a spirit? It means that the the, the sense. That sense of seeing has not been developed to the place where it can see spiritual things. Christ walked this earth and he saw spirits all the time. We have not been able to see because we have been, been, been focused on the five senses. When we begin to have such in-depth relationship with God, that sense of seeing will be developed and inspired to be able to see into the spiritual world. It is this what Jesus said when he said to us, anoint our eyes with eyes that we may see. He wasn't talking about seeing in the physical, but seeing in the spiritual. Now, let us be a little more comprehensive or take a, a little more excuse me, comprehensive look, <laughs> this is where you shouldn't miss the talk, into the faith of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 27, 
verses 45 and 46, I read. Now, don't blink to listen up. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabbathani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, it is important that as you listen, you grasp a sense of what was taking place with Christ at the cross. Because it is on the cross that the fullness of the faith of Jesus was seen manifested. The scriptures declared, declares that at about the sixth hour, which is about 12 o'clock in the noonday, the darkness covered the entire land until about the ninth hour, which is about three o'clock in the afternoon. Those two hours are sacred to God. It is the time that the morning and evening sacrifice was presented. It is the time that you should be presenting on a daily basis, your evening and morning sacrifice, not a animal lamb, but the life of Yeshua lifting up at those sacred hours. Keep that in mind. Now, we understand that this darkness, while literal, symbolized the anguish and re revulsion that was now the experience of Christ. It represented the fact that he was now shut out from the Father by the sins of the world that he was carrying. This was a time of severe suffering. Bear with me here tonight, beloved. Pray hard. Hear the words of the inspired writer, E.G. Hear this, hear this, hear this, hear this, hear this, hear this. Listen again. It says, upon the, the cross, the pristine son of God took upon himself the burden of sin. The burden of sin beloved, is the separation from God that comes as a result of transgression. On the cross, Christ felt in his soul, oh my goodness, as a real experience, the appalling separation that sin makes between God and man. This inspiration say wrong. Listen to me, it's like when you're ringing close, it wrong the heart of Jesus and brought from his lips the agonizing cry, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? She went on to say, it was the burden of sin, the sense of its terrible massacre, uh, of its separation of the soul from God that tested the fate of Christ and developed, beloved, and brought into existence the kind of faith that we are to have today that enabled him to operate, that's Christ, beyond the realm of human existence and human consciousness. Hear me now. On the cross, during those hours, beloved, Christ had to operate beyond the realm of human existence and human consciousness. It is this faith that is called the faith of Jesus. As Christ experienced the cross, on the cross, stay with me, is examined, we must note, oh, you must take note tonight, that Christ needed a faith that could function at a time when everything among him was black in the midst of the intense darkness of sin that separated him from God. And this was a real separation. Christ needed a faith that would operate beyond the apparent abandonment of God. How often 
when in even now, when we do not hear from God, when as we are not seeing miracles as it was done in the ancient time, as we're not seeing prayers being answered, our churches being filled as it was in the past, in, in, in the past, as we see that we, we sort of let go of God. But God wants to develop in us a faith that could function beyond our five senses. Still further, Christ needed a faith that could operate beyond the boundaries of reason, intellect, and human consciousness. So let me quote for you, Desire of Ages, page 753. This is the most significant statement you will read about what Christ went through on the cross. I quote, the withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in the hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was his agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Satan, with his fierce temptation, wrung the heart of Jesus. Hmm. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of his father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared, watch that word now, he feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy no longer pleads for the guilty race. You see, that anguish that will feel, that Christ felt, and the sinner will feel that is hell. Not the fire. The fire comes as an act of mercy to take them out of hell. The anguish of that separation, that is hell. Another time we'll talk about that. It was the sense of sin bringing the father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. Desire of Ages, page 753. Now let's reason this out to its very end. In the, in the statement I read, the inspired pen of E.G. White gives an idea of the mental state of Christ upon the cross. In the following words, the mental attitude of Christ is revealed. Listen, eh? the Savior could not see beyond the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave, a conqueror. Here's attitude. Here is mental state. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that the separation was to be eternal. This indicates that the powers of hell, listen carefully, was able to play some form of a mental blockage of, on Christ's mind so that he could not recall to mind the many promises of his resurrection. A little while before that, it is Christ who stood up and said, destroy this body and I will raise it up in three days. Destroy this temple. Christ couldn't even remember that. The, the mental blockage was so powerful. Not having hope that he would come from forth from the grave, a conqueror, and fearing that he was about to be eternally separated from his father, placed such intense mental anguish, my goodness, upon Christ, that it made it impossible for him to use the powers of intellect and reason to exercise faith. The question is, if Christ's intellect and reason did not produce the faith needed at that critical moment, then where did it come from? Let us talk about that a little more now. If humanly speaking, Christ was not in a rational enough frame of mind to exercise faith. How did faith come into action at the crucial, critical point in this at that time? The faith that operated in Christ was the very faith that he exercised in the Father on a daily basis, but was now sealed within him. John 6, 27. The Bible tells us that. Now, 
The Bible tells us if we are listening, Christ seek those things which are above. Now, listen. The faith of Jesus. Hear me well now. And we're going to talk. The faith of Jesus at that point in time was stored with his divinity. Don't forget that. It was stored with his divinity so that when faith was shut out from his humanity by the darkness of sin, it remained functional in divinity. At that time, humanity was totally surrendered to divinity so that divinity was to act on behalf of humanity. In other words, divinity, during the life of Christ, his humanity, this is what we have to do. His humanity gave to his divinity power of attorney. Now follow me carefully. Now, th this what you call a power of attorney is a written document, a legal document, that appoints an agent to act on your behalf if you are incapacitated and you are unable to function, especially mentally and so forth. This document is especially useful to persons who are ill and are unable to conduct their own affairs, affairs. So that a power of attorney gives someone else the authority to make certain decisions, help, and act on your behalf. Hallelujah. Executing a power of attorney does not mean that you can no longer make the decision. It just means that another person can act for you also. You are simply sharing your power with that some with someone else. So listen to me carefully here now. This is getting beautiful. From the time of the cross, Christ, the Son of Man, hear my words well, the Son of Man was unable to conduct his own affairs because of the satanic pressure. Satan and the entire host of hell came up against the Son of Man. Those satanic pressures upon his humanity, but, hear the beautiful thing, he, Yeshua the Son of Man, had already given power of attorney into the hands of his Father to conduct all his affairs. Luke 23, 46 says, and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I command my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. This final decision that Christ would die on the cross was made by divinity under the authority of his humanity. As Christ's faith was in the Father, so the faith of those who are to stand in the last days, beloved, must help, must be in him also. But Christ did not wait on the cross to give to the Father the power of eternity. All through his life, he said, Father, your will be done. You take charge. You let divinity take full control of me. And this is what we need to do. This is what we need to do now. We need to surrender my goodness on a daily basis, give, put our full faith in divinity to take charge of our fears. When that time should come, when we have to stand before the beast power, beloved, when persecution is on the church, when humanism, that that deadly philosophy prophesied by the clay of Daniel 2 will unite with Roman Catholicism represented by the iron church and state mingled together to come up against God's people. We would have been sealed, our faith would have been sealed and we would have given the, the, uh, the, the full authority for God to make our decision. And that's what it is about tonight. It's not just about doctrine, beloved. Tomorrow, please, the Lord, I hope you will join me 
Because I'll be talking, God is revealing some things to me. Don't miss tomorrow, please, God. I'll be talking about the conscience. I'm just going to tickle your mind a little bit. You know, God doesn't want us to live by the law. He wants us to live by our conscience. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God doesn't want us to live by the law. Sometimes we don't even understand what the law says. Sometimes we don't even understand what the law means. But if we do with our conscience what the Bible says to do with it, God will be able to speak to us directly through our conscience. Tomorrow morning, don't miss that message because Satan is going to attack your conscience. He wants you to reach the place where your conscience is seared. You can't hear God's voice again. Don't miss tomorrow morning, beloved. This fee. I want to go one step further before I close off tonight. Satan's ultimate plan in this final hour is to destroy faith in God. This, the philosophy of humanism, is well up to do. A careful look into humanism ethical beliefs will confirm that the purpose of Satan in this philosophy is to attack God's law, destroy faith, and make them both void and irrelevant to the human mind. The church is not recognizing that. We're still bringing people to talk about self-esteem. We're still doing that and thinking it is good. And that's the deadly thing with humanism. It will appear as a good philosophy. It will appear as a philosophy that will help man self-actualize and grow and recognize and, and find themselves. Woo! I talked to you on that earlier on. This philosophy is deadly. Humanism, ethical beliefs will confirm that this is Satan's purpose, to attack God's law, destroy faith, and make both of them irrelevant and void to the human man. The religion of humanism believes that it is necessary for a humanist to frame, justify, and explain their meanings, values, and morals of life. They do feel a sense of obligation to carry out their own ethical inquiries with the purpose of constructing and living by their own ethical philosophy. Thus, no values or morals must be imposed upon the humanist. No religious creed must be imposed upon the humanist. Furthermore, humanists believe that human morals must be based not on the standard of moral laws given by God, but or by any divine being, but upon but must must be uh, uh, produced by humans themselves and based upon human needs, human experiences, and human reasons. Why reason? While the humanist challenges such things as racism, nationalism, sexism, homophobia, and other forms of bigotry and advocate the right of individual the rights of individual this is not merely about uh, not merely about the person as a human being but the support of certain moral standards such as homosexuality and lesbianism and since the philosophy of humanism is that no values or moral must be imposed upon them by any divine being it remains that the only standard by which such conduct as homosexuality, lesbianism, can be judged is their own standard. This philosophy, beloved, actually eliminates the existence of sin, wrong, and evil in general. Why do you think by these so-called televangelists that is preaching this get rich message, they no longer preach in repentance and forsaking of sin and heaven and these things because 
they are centered on humanism, which is a which is a religion that is centered in self. And within the Adventist church, these poisonous doctrines and lectures are coming in about self. And so you no longer hear about self-denial. You no longer hear about slaying self, putting self to death. You hear about, 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 about pampering self and, 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 and self-actualization and, 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 and things like love yourself and so forth and, and, and twisting the scriptures to justify that self-centered religion that is called humanism. Wake up, church. We are in serious battle. But if all you can see is the battle between Saturday and Sunday, you have missed the mark, and I'm sorry for you. If you think Satan is coming to you to tell you Sunday is the Sabbath as a Seventh-day Adventist, you have another thing coming. Satan has a more subtle plan, and that plan is started at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He brought it through down through Greek philosophy, through certain uh, uh, academic uh, uh, philosophers and, and savants, uh, the, the, the Aristotle and the, the Plato and the Socrates, and now it is part of the church and of the state and of the and of religion today. We must stand firm. See God for that uh, greater experience of the faith of Jesus. I haven't finished yet. On Wednesday, please the Lord, I will be continuing because I want to show you how through humanism, Satan is seeking to dethrone God, dethrone God, and to dethrone God, the only place he can dethrone God is in the mind of the creatures, and he can only do so by attacking faith. Don't miss Wednesday service. I want to give a few minutes for any one of you that have questions that you want to ask, anything you want to clarify, just talk to me right now and we will go. I no want to go further on this because this is plenty food here right now. Bishop, good night. Good night, my beloved brother. I want to ask two questions. Yes. The first, what he has gone through in the garden, I'll get somebody where Satan and bring her to him, telling him he could be separated from his father for eating, from eternity, for eternity. Go again. I want to ask two questions, right? Yes. The first is where Satan had brought to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, telling him why try to save the human or mankind when he could be separated from his father for eternity. Mm -hmm. Right? So on the cross now where he could not see himself coming forth, from the portal yeah. of the tomb. He was already sealed in the garden of Gethsemane, right? He was what? Already sealed in the garden of Gethsemane. If he was already sealed, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And the next question now is as we know, he cried out his father and asked him, Why have thou forsaken me? And he lost all senses. But before he died or before he gave up the ghost, did he ever regain that consciousness or come back to his senses to know what had happened? Well, well, from the time. From the time Yeshua said it is finished, it means that the separation that he was experiencing between himself and the Father no longer existed. Wow. Amen? Understand. Yes, understand. Yes. Amen. Anybody else? Come on, let's talk tonight. Bishop, Bishop. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. It's not, I just, just got in, so I, I you know. But there's a question. There was a program that was just coming over my radio today while I was driving, and something that the person was a religious station, and something they said, and I was thinking, of, you remember, I mean, many times you have preached the sermon, and you have, and if we totally be, understand and believe it, that God do not kill, okay? But on, on the radio, they would say, the lady was like, you all know God, God do, do kill. This is what she was saying in the, the, the program. And then she used this as an example. Remember, uh, she used some, some one of the, I don't know if it's one of these disciples, somebody that God, uh, anyway, my mind was, was, was running on Moses. When Moses was basically put, what we would say, put to sleep, right? 
So what would you call that? Is it just withdrawing his hands and let, well, how do you explain that to someone? All right, before God, I explain, God do not kill. Right, before I explain, I have always said that we have made, and I'm not directing this to you, but just for edification for all. Mm -hmm. We have made a serious error in studying the Bible from a proof text point of view. And sometimes people lure us into discussion on the basis of truth text. You must never allow yourself to be taken into discussion on a proof text principle. No, no, remember, it was not a discussion. It's just no, I understand. So just listen, okay. try and listen, try and listen. Okay. I'm only edifying you. I'm not saying that this is what happened with you. Oh, okay. Right. We must never allow ourselves to be drawn in by a proof text situation. So whenever questions come up to us, whether it be a discussion or not, as it relates to whether God kill or not, I want, I'm looking for you to be developed to the place, for you to address it with yourself on the basis of principle, not on the basis of a text that you heard. So let's get something here. Let's take get the principle here that is important. When what you have to what is a simple principle? When Adam sinned, the Bible says, when Adam sinned, all men die. Are you with me? Yes. So the Moses was dead. Moses, Moses was just kept alive by the grace of God. He was already dead because of sin. God didn't have to kill him. We don't understand principle. Through Adam, all have died. Everybody, because of sin, is dying. We think we live in. So I so let me just see if I understand. So you, you are saying that even though people look at it as God put Adam to 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 sleep, it's just God removal of his hands, of his hands of That's protection. All. That's which, all. Oh yeah, yes, which we we all learned and believe. So it's not. So it's just it, by, by somebody using that as an example. Like, okay, God put God God put uh, uh, um Moses to to our yes. sleep. Is isn't that killing him? But it's just his removal of his hand. We are all, all dead, right. yes. but just the just removal of his hands yes. and the the breath of life that is taken away. Beautiful. So now we have to understand. If we have to start to re re be re-educated and overloving, we are not living. We are dying. Sin rendered us that way. The reason why some of us making 60, like me, and 70 is grace. Mm -hmm. Grace simply slowed down a process. That yeah. started from the time sin entered, so that we can have time to get things in order with God. And from the time we are born, we are from dying. the time we are born. So, so people come in with those type of things. I have, I have, I give God thanks and praise for that. I've matured enough. I have learned not to involve myself in certain things. People want to come and argue, look God did it and look God did it. My days for that, done. If you want to sit down and have a proper structural study on the basis of principles set out in the Absolutely. Holy Scriptures on the matter, I will do that. But Absolutely. if you come in to argue with me, look what happened to, to Lot, look what happened to this one, look what mm -hmm. happened to, I, I don't discuss the Scriptures like that. No, I have no interest in so discussing it, and I have no interest in listening to people who preach it that way either. Amen? Good. Good night, my beloved brother. I see your brother, Michelle. Thank God to have you. Yes, I appreciate that, brother. Yes, anybody else on the, on the topic we are here with now? Any question? Now, by, by the time you're coming up with your questions, have you ever take time to meditate on the statement by the prophet that says Christ could not see beyond the portals of the tomb. Hope did not um, tell him that he will come forth from the grave a conqueror. 
and that he feared that he would be eternally separated from God? Now, if all of that was on, on the mind of Yeshua and his conclusion, well, look, listen, if I go through with these things, I will be eternally separated from God. You know what's the decision that Christ made for you and I? Christ made a decision to be eternally lost so that you and I could be eternally saved. When I read that statement, I, and I, I said, Lord, have mercy. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to give up the temporal life on this earth for somebody. But it's another thing to love somebody so much that you are willing to lose your very soul to save that person. And Christ. The Lord. Bishop, did you just say that Christ was thinking that he would be eternally lost or separated? You had a statement again. From God? I, I read it for you. So you gotta you gotta you gotta hear it again. I want to read it for you so you could get it. It's from the book Desire of Ages, page yes. 753. I'll read it again for you, and you can read it for yourself. It says, The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish, that's on the cross, pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Satan with his fierce temptation wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. He couldn't see that he would be resurrected. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror. He couldn't see that he would come forth from the grave a conqueror. Or tell him of his father's acceptance of his sacrifice. He feared you, you, oh, this is the supreme son of God. You know? He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish with the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. So let me explain mm -hmm. something. So when, you hear it say, when you hear it says, that Jesus took our place. Don't take that superficially. Our place is hell. Sin have placed us in hell. Christ had us to go there in a real way. On our behalf. And the mystery of godliness brought him back from hell victorious. Bishop, so if we reach a, a place where we cannot see, where we have doubts and we cannot see that we could be, let, let's say someone, and they cannot see how they could be saved and you have that kind of doubt. You know, I, I have done so much wrong in life. I have done so, uh, so that is not silly. Yes, no. Let me just say that yeah. what you are asking there. It cannot be compared with what Christ went through. That's not doubt. That's not just that's just not normal doubt. You didn't come on in time, but you would have heard me explain how Satan and hell put a mental block so powerful on Christ that he couldn't even see the presence of God. He couldn't even feel it. That's a that's a whole different level altogether. Give God Bishop. thanks and praise. Praise Bishop. Praise the Lord. Yes. Bishop. Go ahead. Seeing what Job went through and what you spoke about, the faith of yes. Jesus, yes. not faith yes. in I Jesus. Trust me. Yes. Hello? Go ahead. Yes. No lying, lying to tell you. Really, really. Wait, just really somebody, right. somebody. Oh, um, mic is on, so just let me get that clear. Somebody, mic is on. Please make sure. Right, go ahead, Sister Carl. Yes. The job had the faith of Jesus. I, I, the question you are asking put me in a place to judge uh, Job's experience and relationship, and therefore it is difficult for me to. I assess that and say yea or nay. What I can say is that Job would have had sufficient faith 
to take him through what he had to go through. What Christ, what Job, what Christ had to go through, what Job went through is nothing to what Christ went through. And therefore, I'm just saying that Job, that Christ's faith is unique because no man have ever gone through what he went through. All right. All reason, reason we, I'm asking that is that you said we have to develop the faith of Jesus. Well, I I'm, I'm, allow me. We move the word develop. You have to receive. You with me? All right. So it is Jesus' faith. You have to receive it. But well, the word develop is used because you cannot receive the faith of Jesus if the faith you already have is not developed to its fullness. All so right. Let's see. We have to develop. When I use the word develop, I'm speaking really about a consciousness that we must have of full cultivation and development of our present faith so that we could so that we can connect to the gift of the faith of Jesus Christ. Well, well, when I um, read Job and seeing the things that he went through and he talked about him, though worms may eat his body and things like that, that is why I ask the question, if he had received the faith of Jesus. I'm just saying that, that I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not um, contending that he did or he didn't. I'm just saying that those type of questions is somewhat difficult and they call, cause uh, they cause theological battles that I am no longer prepared to go into. You understand what I'm saying? So the mm -hmm. way I answered you is really to avoid that. Because I'm about sanctification. I'm about saving souls. I'm, I'm no longer in the, in, the, in, the, in the field of theological battles and theological arguments. I'm not saying that is what you are looking at. But I'm just telling you. So in, in, in how I would deal with things, as you grow for yourself in the knowledge of truth, you will then learn how to answer things to avoid vain babbling. Because that's what people are often after when they ask certain things. <laughs> you understand? Now I know you are not after that, so I take my time and answer you. You understand? Right? So he may or he may not. Brother Curtis. Good night, good night to all. Good night. Happy good Sabbath. Night. Um I I have a little question here. If no, if something that seemed to be Distressful happening to somebody, whatever it might be, right? One side of the fence will say that God testing your feet or is strengthening your feet, right? And the other side would say that the devil attacking you so that you will lose faith in God. Which which is it? Because you find people that stay too different, take have two different opinions about why certain things that is not is not pleasant is happening to you. Which is it? You, you, you simply have to remember that neither God or Satan is, is in this, this kind of a direct way coming to deal with anybody. There are circumstances and situations that arisen that puts us in a position to make decisions. When we make decisions, we then determine which side of the of of those two things you mentioned that we find ourselves on based on the decisions we make the decisions that we make has to do with the will and neither god nor satan could arbitrarily interfere with the will so the question is not about so much whether it is god doing it or satan doing it the question that the believer must answer is what I am under God. Whatever situation I find myself, Lord, help me to use this situation to, to deepen my relationship with you. That really should be it. It shouldn't be whether God doing it or Satan doing it and all of that. Those are things that we were called here to talk about and ask and try to find out. You don't need that. You're following what I'm saying? Yeah, but the person who don't know God Right, he he would have a, he would have his opinion that is contrary to the person who know God, and he have his thinking. He have his thinking. 
You don't have to study for the man who don't know God and thinking. You have to study for you who know him and how you think. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I follow that. Yeah. Right. And that's yes, important, beloved. Uh, I'm Wait. coming. And, and and the reason why I'm answering you also is because I, I hope that you are with me. I, I am seeking to take this church to another level of thinking. Not the not the denominational way of thinking and the and and the and the, the doctrinal way of thinking. Doctrine is correct. You must have true doctrine. But doctrine is not meant for us to live by, you know. Doctrine is meant to guide our conscience. Wait, I, I don't want to go into tomorrow's message. Doctrine is meant to guide our consciences. The law is meant to guide our conscience. But if we don't sanctify that conscience and 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 hear and be able to hear God communicating to us through it, doctrine are going to help us. Yes, Sister Cheryl. Yeah. I yes, I'm Bishop. Go ahead. You're speaking about the faith of Jesus, right? Yes. And you gave the example about when he couldn't see beyond the portals and yes. that is faith. But did he, as from a babe, came with that faith since it is the faith of Jesus? Did he have that faith from the beginning when he entered into the world? And if so, would we, and, and, and it was just manifested at that point in time? Right. Oh, so whenever and, you, right. go ahead, so go ahead, whenever you ask, ask questions like that, Sister Cheryl, mm -hmm. always ask who are you asking it to? Are you asking it of the Son of God or are you asking it of the Son of Man? Okay, right, clearly. Right. And if you ask, if you make that clear uh, separation in your mind, it will you give the answer. Have the answer. Right, because, because the, the, son of, of, the Son of God will always have always. Correct. So the Son and of it, God. It, not, so it is only the Son of God that experiences that, not the Son of Man. Who, if it is only. No, Remember really... that anything the Son of God experience is shared with the Son of Man. And vice right. Him. Okay, so then then that brings me to, to when he came in. So, okay, okay, so all right, all right. So therefore it will show that since it, from the beginning he came with with that faith. Well, um, well, well, he, but well, it was manifested then? The Son of the, just as how we develop faith, the mm -hmm. Son of Man developed his faith. Right. Okay. And and it is the ex the the. But remember, you have to remember again. You want to know who you're speaking about here. Remember, mm -hmm. when I was speaking a while ago. I said that there is an experience that the Son of God had for over four thousand years, battling with Satan, that no man could ever have. Okay. Okay. Beautiful. Right. Now, what was the role? There? It was the role of the Son of God to share that experience of victory with the Son of Man. As he shared the victory with the Son of Man, the Son of Man's faith keep developing and developing until itself could have withstand what he went through at the cross. And, and that is exactly what we will be going to. That's correct. Divinity okay. must share with humanity. I'm pointing to some any other question, beloved? This is not milk here. We are dealing with some meat here, and we need you to be on praying grounds. Any other question? We are going to take a couple others. When half, to, half eight, I want to round up for you. So talk to me. I see some scholars on, man. I want to say good night. Uh, to the Johns, thank God to have you. I know where the Burton is, they're living, listening. But the Sami, I'm happy to see you on tonight. Amen. Uh, Shondell, I uh, want to welcome you on tonight. Thank God to have you in the name of Jesus. Sister Donna, I know you are a deep thinker. Thank God to have you tonight as well. And all the other Sister Myrtle, I'm glad to see you on. And all the others with it. Any other question? Sure. Brother Mitchell, Brother Mitchell, I sure. want to, to have you. Yes, talk to me. But what you and sister, sister I'm I'm not hearing you now. I was hearing okay. you very clear before. Okay, what you hearing me again? You have to go back to where you were before. Okay, I am right here. Just my name. Yeah, but I'm not hearing something is turned down. 
Okay, okay. What you want, Sister Cheryl was just talk, talking about. Do uh, well, you may not know, you may not be able to give a definite answer, but do you think that there is any just human being that ever come even close to what the Son of Man, the kind of faith that he experienced through the Son of God? Any man, any human created human ever came even close to experiencing that no or oh, live I live in that way no none okay no. okay yeshua's faith was beyond anything we could imagine remember the statement i read for you so, so said, are you saying we will never no human will ever attain that we will we will experience it that. because he will share it with us but we will never attain it ourselves without no, him. No, no, no. Because okay. we have to go through what he went through. Okay. And no man could bear what he went through. You understand? So even in in, in upcoming times, it doesn't matter what stage of persecution we go through. No, it will it, never, we will never no. come close. No, I'll tell you why. Experiencing what he did. Let, let me give you an idea why, right? The we, every individual, let's say God was to put us in that position. Every individual could only bear their own sin. You remember Christ was bearing the sins of every single person from Adam to the very last man that would be alive in him. And he wasn't behind bearing the sins of those who accept him. You know? He wasn't bearing the sins of those who receive him. You know? He was bearing the sins of the world. You, you get that? Just imagine having to bear all that sin, to feel that level of separation, that quantity, the separation that every single man that ever come into this world experienced Christ, was upon Christ. We, you, 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 you know, as we think more and more deeply, beloved, we'll understand who Christ is, you know, and Bishop, what he has done for us, you know. Bishop, I think it's a couple of months ago, I'm not really sure if it's months, but when we were talking about um, that well it, it had a, a part of it it wasn't that topic that God don't that you you wouldn't be uh, like how people believe in the fire <clears throat> and and burning and burning and feeling the burning and all of that and that God wouldn't do such wickedness yes. do you remember that when we were studying that yeah and so so the, the what you were just talking about what God what the son of man experience with mm -hmm. bearing everybody's sin. So is it that like the 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 lost? Yes. Would that be something that they would be experiencing that will probably not something like that contribute exactly to that. their death? Exactly that. Before they even fire even have that. Before the fire, to, the to, the, to the wicked will be glad for the fire. Because they will be experiencing something like what the son of man. Not man. something like they'll be experiencing that. They'll be experiencing the same separation that Christ experienced. Because Christ experienced it, we don't have to experience it. But the wicked who didn't accept Christ, they now have to come. And, and that experience of separation from God, that is hell. Hear me again. That is hell. So some people who think it, okay, well, even if I go to hell, that's nothing. I will just do what I have to do, and then I will just burn and I will die. It's not so, beloved. That period of time, and I've always told you based on Isaiah prophecies, I always believe that that period of time of separation that will be experienced would be at least 100 years. You know what it is to go through in a, for at least a hundred years living in total separation from God. All the guilt and everything you ever do, all the sins you ever do, you're bearing it for yourself. You know what is that? 
We love it when the final hour, when the fire come down from heaven, they will receive that like people thirsty for water. You don't want to go to him. You don't want to experience him. But Bishop, what Christ went through, yes, what, what, what um, the Son of God went through, and passed talking to the Son of Man, he said we'd be experiencing the same thing. Yes, I understand that, but his own would have been in a greater magnitude because he bared the sins of everyone, whilst we would be just be bearing the sins you mean of the lost. Son. The lost. The lost. I just, yes. Yes, yes, not sir. even the lost is going to really fully Ex experience, experience what, what, what he, he experienced. Yes, yes, yeah. that's God's mercy. And and I think that that is the reason why God um even used the son of um, man, and that's why we still have to see the importance of the son of man. Oh, definitely. So that he felt the fullness of that separation yes. Yes. through yes. the son of God, yes. so that he could make, still understand and suffer and, you know, as man, Amen. he's only one to experience that. He's got a brother, how it's Mike is on. Yes, Bishop. I think um, that statement with Jesus bearing the sin of the world, that's very deep because when I look at myself, if I should wrong somebody and I know that I sin, it's mm -hmm. coming like a burden on me, you know? Yes. And I repent, you know? So imagine him with the sin of the world. Mm hmm you know, so that's real deep. Mm -hmm. Very deep. You're very clear, beloved. And so, beloved, when you think of these things, you would now understand when the Bible said, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Let us do it right, beloved. Let us repent, put away sin, and walk with God. I thank you so very much for being such a wonderful congregation tonight. And may you go back, study. Remember, you can always go to our website at www.freeangelsmovement.com and you will see a book there called The Religion of the New World Order. All that I'm studying with you here Tonight is in that book, and you can begin to do your own reading online concerning this, what I'm studying with you. May God help you to have that zeal in Yahshua's name. Amen. Let us pray and close our session today. Father in heaven, we give you thanks, we give you praise, we give you the glory and the honor. May thy Holy Spirit be with us, O God. Oh, the things you have revealed to us, the, your love so deep, so sacrificial, that we humble ourselves before thee and say thank you. Be merciful with us. Guide us and direct us. We recommit all things into your care and keeping. And now may the grace of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and may the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us all, now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Remember, you can go to our website also or to our YouTube channel and you can also listen to this message again or to our Facebook page. God bless. Shalom. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom one and all. Shalom one and all. Shalom, shalom. A wonderful Sabbath rest. Bless the Lord. Bless the Shalom Lord. Shalom to each and everyone. Shalom to you. Shalom to you. Praise God. Amen. Shalom. Amen.